In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Mother Church rejoices today with all the angels and saints in heaven, honoring one of these great Roman martyrs from the early church, St. Cecilia. She shines as one of those great Roman virgins who could have easily married, which she did, in fact, but against her will. And she consecrated her whole heart, her whole body, everything to Christ. And she was very zealous as well. So she converts quite a few to come to the Catholic faith. So she goes to heaven, and with her she takes many friends. So here's her story, here's her account. She was a, a patrician girl, which was a, of the noble rank of Rome, and she was brought up a Christian. She wore a coarse garment beneath the clothes of her rank, so beneath her fancy clothes she wore uh, p instruments of penance. She fasted from food several days a week and determined to remain a virgin, consecrated to the love of God. But her father had other views and gave her in marriage against her will to a young patrician named Valerian. On the day of the marriage, amid the music and rejoicing of the guests, St. Cecilia sat apart, singing to God in her heart and praying for help in her predicament. And this is why she's called the patroness of music, because at her wedding day, she's singing to God in her heart. When they retired to their room, she took her courage in both hands and said to her husband gently, I have a secret to tell you. You must know that I have an angel of God watching over me. If you touch me in the way of marriage, he will be angry and you will suffer. But if you respect my virginity, he will love you as he loves me. And then Valerian said, show me this angel. If he be of God, I will refrain as you wish. And St. Cecilia said, if you believe in the living and the one true God and receive the water of baptism, then you shall see the angel. Valerian agreed and was sent to find Pope Urban, among the poor, near the third milestone of the Appian Way, outside of Rome. He was received with joy, and there appeared a venerable old man bearing a writing, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, above all, and in us all. Do you believe this? Valerian was asked, and he assented and was baptized by Pope Urban. Then he, ret he returned to St. Cecilia and found standing by her side as she was kneeling in prayer an angel surrounded by light who put upon the head of each a chaplet of roses and lilies. Then came his brother Tiburtius, and he too was offered a deathless crown if he would renounce his false gods. At first he was incredu incredulous. Who, he asked, has returned from beyond the grave to tell us of this other life? Since Cecilia talked long with him, until he was convinced by what she told him of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he too was baptized, and at once experienced many marvels. From that time forth the two young men gave themselves up to good works. Because of their zeal in burying the bodies of martyrs, they were both arrested. Almachius, the prefect, bore before they were brought, before whom they were brought, began to cross-examine them. The answers he received from Tiburtius, he set down as the ravings of a madman. And in turning to Valerian, his brother, he remarked that he hoped to hear more sense from him than from, any, than from his crazy brother. Valerian replied that he and his brother were under the charge of one and the same physician, 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who could impart to them his own wisdom. He then proceeded at some length to compare the joys of heaven with those of earth. So he was teaching him catechism. But Amachius, the Roman governor in charge of their case, told him to, to cease prating and to tell the court if he would sacrifice to the gods and go forth free. Tiburtius and Valerian both replied, No, not to the gods, but to the one God to whom we offer sacrifice daily. The prefect asked whether Jupiter was the name of their god. No, indeed, said Valerian. Jupiter was a corrupt libertine, and according to the testimony of your own writers, a murderer as well as a criminal. So, yes, open brackets, that's a, that is a point that many of the martyrs brought up to their, their court cases, is that the Roman gods that they burn incense to, which are devils, they portrayed all vices, envy, anger, murder, lust, stealing. So they would often use the gods against the Roman emperors and say the gods commit all kinds of vices. How can they be holy? And then preach to them our Lord Jesus Christ. So Valerian rejoiced when they were delivered over to be scourged and cried out to the Christians there present. Roman citizens, do not let me, my suffering frighten you away from the truth, but cling to the one holy God and trample under your feet the idols of wood and stone which Amachius worships. Even then the prefect was disposed to allow them a rest in which to reconsider their refusal, but his assessor assured him that he would only use the time to distribute their possessions thus preventing the state from confiscating their property. They were accordingly condemned to death and were beheaded in a place called Pagus Triopius, four miles from Rome. With them perished one of the officials, one of the Roman officers, named St. Maximus, who had declared himself a Christian after witnessing their fortitude. So here you have Tiberius and his brother Valerian and St. Cecilia all baptized with water. And then you've got St. Maximus, who, seeing the bravery of these two brothers, declares himself also a Christian and is instantly martyred in his blood. St. Cecilia gave burial to the three bodies, and then she in turn was called on to repudiate her Catholic faith. Instead, she converted those who came to induce her to sacrifice to the gods of Rome. And when Pope Urban visited her at home, he baptized over 400 people there, one of them named Gordian, a man of high rank. He established a church in her house, which Urban later dedicated to her name. So today, when you go to Rome, you go to You'll, you'll see the Basilica of St. Cecilia, which was her house. And being a, Patric a daughter of a patrician, it was a very wealthy house, you know, full of marble and baths and all sorts of things. And all that was converted into the Basilica later and added on. When she was eventually brought into court, Amachius argued with St. Cecilia at some length and was not a little provoked by her attitude. At length, she was sentenced to be suffocated to death in the bathroom of her own house. But though the furnace was led, but though the furnace was fed with seven times more its normal amount of fuel, Saint Cecilia remained for a day and a night without receiving any harm in the fire. And a soldier was sent to behead her. He struck at her neck three times but her head would not be cut off, and then he left her lying. She was not dead and lingered alive three days more, during which the Christians flocked to her side, and she formally made over her house to Urban 
the Pope, and committed her household to his care. She was buried next to the papal crypt in the catacomb of St. Calixtus. So her body, what lied in that catacomb up until the 1600s, and it was incorrupt. It was found incorrupt. Here's that account. Pope St. Paschal, in, 18, in 817 to 824, removed the body, the relics of St. Cecilia, which he found in consequence of a vision or a dream, not in the cemetery of St. Calixtus, but in that of St. Pretextatus, together, together with those of Saints Valerian, Tiburtius, the two brothers, and Maximus, the officer who converted and was killed instantly, and they were taken to the church of St. Cecilia in Trastevere, in the year 1599, Cardinal Savondrati, in repairing the church, reinterred the relics of the four martyrs, the body of St. Cecilia being alleged to be then still incorrupt and completely whole. Although Pope Paschal had enshrined the head separately, and between 847 and 855 it was mentioned among the relics of the, at the Church of the Four Crowned Ones. The story goes that in 1599, the sculptor Maderna was allowed to see the body and made a life-size statue of what he is said to have seen. It looked very real and very moving. He said, not lying upon her back like a body in a tomb, but upon the right side as a maiden in her bed, her knees drawn together and seeming to be asleep. This statue is in the church of St. Cecilia under the altar next to the place where the relics were reburied in a silver coffin. It bears the sculptor's inscription, which reads, Behold the most holy virgin Cecilia, whom I myself saw lying incorrupt in her tomb. I have made for you in this marble an image of that saint in the very posture of her body. De Rossi located the original burying place of St. Cecilia in the cemetery of St. Calixtus, and a replica of Moderna statue now occupies that space. So I've seen that in the catacombs, and for since the 1600s you have that space, and it's a space inside the catacomb wall, and... Lying in there is the marble statue of St. Cecilia in that position. So you might see that often that statue is pretty popular. And you can see it in many different places. A lot of people have statues of it who have been to Rome. And in 1800s, late 1800s, St. Teresa, she was with a group of people and her father. And they went to Rome on their pilgrimage. She describes it in her autobiography. And she remembers, she describes seeing this very statue of St. Cecilia. And when all the crowds left, she stayed behind and dug up some of the dirt from the, the walls in there and kept it as relics. So she describes that. So great St. Cecilia, she shines and she's a model for the girls of today. The girls of today who are also... Surrounded by the whole pagan world again, dragging girls into vice and sin and loose living. They need to look up to St. Cecilia and see in her the model of uh, one who consecrates her soul and body to God and loves God with all her heart. But she's not silent about it either. She even tries to convert the judge to the faith and explains the Catholic faith to the one she was forced to marry, she converts his brother and many hundreds of others. So she had to have a, a great influence. She was probably very well educated being raised in Rome and going through the Roman schools. So she was able to unite her good knowledge and her, 
her schooling with baptized by the Catholic faith, she was able to convey the faith by her words and prayer to many other souls. So let's pray to St. Cecilia and her companion martyrs and pray for the, the state of the church today. We also are being asked to burn incense to the gods, but not the gods of Rome, but to the, the new devils, the new gods of Vatican II and the new mass and the new code and the whole new conciliar religion. We are being demanded and, and you and I could have a very easy life if we just went to the local Navasoto church or to the compromise groups like St. Peter's and now the new conciliar SSPX. could be a very easy life. You just go along. But they have all decided by their own choice, certainly among the leaders, to burn incense to these false gods. And these false gods of compromising with Vatican II, with the new mass, and the new code, and all this whole conciliar new, new religion of Vatican II. And how, why do we know it's a new religion? Because it contradicts what the Church has always taught. And all those errors that the popes of the past have condemned infallibly, like religious liberty, the false religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality, freedom of conscience, separation of church and state, all these things were, that were condemned are all taught and glorified in the documents of Vatican II. So there's a blatant contradiction. And since God doesn't contradict himself, the Holy Ghost cannot contradict himself. The spirit of truth can never lie. One of them is wrong, either Vatican II or the Holy Ghost that guided all the popes before. So the popes of Vatican II promote this, these new doctrines, these novelties and heresies. So we stay with Catholic tradition. We have to refuse to burn incense that is, compromise with these errors. Hence, the Catholic resistance. Hence, Catholics throughout the world opposing the compromise with error in, in Vatican II and the New Mass. So we got to hold fast and strong, turning to the Blessed Virgin Mary, who, anyone who runs to her, anyone who gathers around her, especially with her rose or in her scapular, will persevere to the end, and she will lead them to her son, and make you strong, and make you victorious, like St. Cecilia, over death, torture, interrogation, etc. So let's turn to St. Cecilia to pray for us. And she's mentioned, she's one of those beautiful Roman martyrs mentioned in the canon of the Mass. So during the Mass, the priest, he, when he sees the name of St. Cecilia in the canon of the Mass, he'll bow his head in, honor of, in her honor today. Uh, that's part of the rubrics. The saints mentioned in the in the missal on their feast day, the head bows towards their name. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us for every course. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.